You elicit people's response on an emotional basis. You're a great interviewer. That same, those skills would make for a great sales rep. And I'm sure you were phenomenal at that and teaching people how to do that. Asking open-ended questions, listening, mirroring, all of these things. Maybe I'm talking too much psychology, but those sort of things are what makes people phenomenal. And so your ability to get a great interview from your guests are some of the same skills that are required for a sales rep to be an exceptional sales rep. And so it really is the art and skill of communicating. And there is a science to it once you start studying it. So how do we apply what you do well to the other 300 interviewers or reps? It's really by studying that and the outcomes, but also understanding that general information or general insights is not very helpful. What I need to do is I need to study what makes you unique so that I can feed you in the moment things that will help you. Every rep has something that makes them unique. Yeah. They have personality styles, they have temperaments, they have different ways of speaking. So how do we study, yes, on a general sense, the tens of thousands of reps that use our application, but then how do we quickly apply that to this rep, talking to this VP of sales at this stage of the sales cycle that will impact the performance of that rep in the moment? That's what we needed. Yeah. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of the Jake Dunlap Show. We are very excited that you joined us. If you haven't tuned in, this is the show where we talk to celebrities, thought, and industry leaders to really discover their journey to success. I am super excited that you're joining us. This show is like no other, I can promise you that. You might laugh, you might cry, but you will definitely leave inspired and gain a whole new level of insight into those people that you follow, love, and admire. All right, welcome everyone to another episode of The Jake Dunlap Show. I'm your host, Jake Dunlap. Obviously, it'd be kind of odd if someone else was you know, kicking it off. Um, very, very fun conversation coming up. You know, I feel like over the last few episodes, we've, we've talked to a lot of people who've had these kind of life moments or points where they went and pursued a passion. And I'm really excited for, for this week's guest. He actually started his career as a licensed marriage and family therapist in 1996, which I think as we get into it, and many of you will know the company where he's the, the CEO of now, um, I'm sure he could never have imagined at that time you know, where he'd end up in this, in this crazy world. Um, here's just a quick snippet of his accomplishments. He's a four-time entrepreneur, leading to multiple acquisitions by publicly traded companies. He's been on all the regulars, Bloomberg, uh, Fox Business, Forbes, Entrepreneur Magazine, Wall Street Journal, just to name a few. And he also has two patents, which it's like from therapy to this to two patents. I mean, this guy, he, he's doing everything. And, and now he's really, I'm going to call him the psychologist of RevOps, Mr. Howard Brown. Howard, thank you for joining us. Jake, it's great to be here. I'm excited. Good. We like that. We like excitement. Right, it's better than melancholy. So, as everyone knows, if you're listening to, uh, in for the first time, uh, this you know our our podcast and, and journey is really about telling other people's journey and the things that we learn early on that help to shape the people that that we become. And that no matter where someone is today, there's a journey and a path that led them to where they are. And so, Howard, we're going to go back in time. We're going to go back to Beverly Hills in the '70s and '80s. All right, and that's where and you were you were born in Beverly Hills. And your dad was the mayor too, which I, I, I can't imagine. Like, if I think of like, just like drama, like there's something about being the mayor of Beverly Hills that feels like, gosh, that would be a very stressful job. Um, and so let's go back. You know, what was it like growing up in Beverly Hills then? You know, what are some of the big, I guess, like key moments that, you know, stand out uh, in those kind of formative years before high school? Yeah, absolutely. So, uh, yeah, definitely an interesting background. I, I grew up in Beverly Hills uh, back in the uh, 70s and 80s. Beverly Hills was sort of the, the mecca of wealth and, and uh, very much a bubble. And, and my father was a, uh, a real estate developer. He was very interested in improving education and, and sort of the direction that the city was going. And uh, a lot of people asked me what was my first job ever. And my first job ever was dressing up in a suit and walking door to door with my dad 
introducing myself as uh, as the son of this uh, gentleman who's campaigning and telling them what a beautiful house they had and asking them if they wanted any improvements to their city. So I was not afraid to network. I was not afraid to make introductions. And uh, it was a great experience. For How me. old were you in that when, whenever you were going door to door? So I think the first time I did it, I was eight years old. Wow. And my dad loved taking me out because I was just I, I was definitely uh, not afraid to interact with people, and and uh, and I was proud of my dad. So it was one of those things that it was really great and fun to do. And but look, there was a downside, right? Once he got elected, once he was in the spotlight, we were all sort of in that spotlight, and I got to meet the uh, president, got to meet the Queen of England. Wow. Um, you know, it was, there was a lot going on. And I think what I was lacking was real connection with my father. He was always working. He was always busy. Um, and I was trying to get attention and I was one of those kids like, Hey, if I can't get positive attention, I'll get it the negative way. And so I pretty much tried to do just about anything I could do, um, that I could get away with. And, and that bound, that that's the bar was set pretty high when your dad's the mayor, because everybody looks the other right. way. What do you, I mean, what are some things, I mean, obviously, so you're kind of getting into the, these like, you know, formative, we'll call it like high school or junior high years, you know, you know again, and you've got, you know, again, a father who's in a very, you know, visible, powerful role. Again, you're, you're just kind of starting to, to go into it, but let's maybe go a little, little deeper. Like, what are some of the, the memories you have from, you know, high school and again? And because obviously I know you talk, you know, I've, I've read some things you've said, I know your father is a big influence, but you know, what kind of student were you? You know, what are some big memories you have from those, those high school years? Yeah, um, I, I definitely was always trying to find my niche, how I could stand out as an individual, not just be my father's son. And I, I, I definitely suffered from uh, learning disorders. I had dyslexia. Um, I had an audible processing disorder, but it was very much undiagnosed. Right. So I was just hyperactive. I was bouncing around. I had trouble staying in my seat. I lacked attention. I lacked focus. I was the kid that had tons of potential, but wasn't living up to it. Um, I liked partying a lot. That was a lot of fun for me. I, I wrecked my first car uh, just uh, four months after I got my driver's license um, it was, uh, it was on. And so I was just having a lot of fun. I was definitely enjoying the, uh, party circuit and the club circuit. By the time I was 17, I was going to clubs twice a week and hanging out with, a you know, it was very much the Hollywood scene in Los Angeles back in the day. Yeah. I can imagine that. So like, this is like what, probably eight mid eighties in right. Early eighties. Yeah. yeah mid eighties. Yeah. yeah. That's also when like, you know, I'm thinking of, you know, I was a big poison fan. And like mm -hmm. during the LA club scene, right? That's like hair metals blowing up, right? Like Motley Crue, Poison, like all these groups. You got it. You, straight on. And Metallica, yeah. saw Metallica a bunch of times and yeah, did, did that whole thing. And um, you yeah, know, it was definitely, it was definitely an exciting time to grow up. It was, uh, you know, there was, there was a lot of ways to get in trouble. I <laughs> love music like you and, so yeah, just just would go out and, and let That's loose. That's awesome, man. Well, I'm sure there's some other stories we can go deep on there. Um, I actually <laughs> not sure how much I'm going to share on this show, though. That's Jake. right. That's right, man. Well, yeah, I, I remember I went to a poison. This is later, and definitely at one point I had taken my shirt off and just threw it, and then into this. I mean, why not? That's what you're supposed to do. And then somehow we snuck backstage and got a meat poison. I just was like, I just snuck in the line to go backstage. The guy saw me about halfway down. He goes, hey, what are you guys doing? I'm like, uh, can we just go, can we just get back there? He's like, yeah, just stand over here though. It's like, yes. So. That's, that's awesome. Right. Yeah, I did the Monsters of Rock tour, saw Rage Against the Machine 13 times. <laughs> I, I, I did it all. Yeah, I love it. Definitely, definitely had my day out there as well. I know, man. If only they could get back together. Um, so, okay, so, but, but you end up going to U of A, right? So you're going to University of Arizona, so, like, grades couldn't have been that. But, I mean, I don't know. Again, maybe it's, like, your dad's helping, too. But, so, I mean, like, is there a point where you kind of are, like, all right, I'm going to still, I'm going to go to college, though, and I'm going to, you know, I've got an idea. I mean, obviously, I know that you, you majored in political science, you know, I think, you know, inspired by your dad a little bit. Uh, like, was there a moment where you're, like, 
okay, I got to lock it up. Or did that just kind of continue? I mean, not like U of A is not a party school, um, too. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I went and visited my sister who was at the U of A. And uh, I went to a party there. It was the best party I had ever been to. The girls were beautiful. Um, I knew that I needed to go to college. It was the right thing to do. I had a my dad always made me work. I had a job from the moment I turned 15. I was, I was, I was doing the, the job below the bus boy at the deli. I had to clean the uh, corned beef cooler that, or heater. Like I had just about every job you can imagine. So from delivering pizza to working at a uh, clothing store, I always worked. So I, I knew the value of work. And he wasn't one of those that spoiled us at all. Um, definitely had to, you know, pay for a big portion of my own car. I had to do all of that. And so, uh, yeah, I wanted to go to school, went to the U of A, um, studied <clears throat> poli sci and business. And, and uh, the first semester was eye opening. I, I met people from all over the country that, uh, you know, sort of made fun of Beverly Hills and made fun of LA and, um, you know, had never met a Jew. I, it was, it was definitely an eye opening experience. And, um, it took me a little while and I found my stride probably the end of my my freshman year. My dad said, look, you got to buckle up. This is about your life now. It's not, you know, the, the, you're investing in yourself. And I just started really enjoying it, doing well and, and, and excelling. I moved back to L.A., got a job at a political consulting firm. I was actually a speechwriter for a while. I ran campaigns, got into real estate, started developing real estate in the city of industry, building industrial buildings. Um, and then I hit 25 and I remember the day I literally went home. I had a house in Venice. I had a beautiful car. I looked in the mirror. I was having trouble sleeping. And I'm like, I don't, I don't even know who I am. I had no clue who I was. I was basically just doing what I thought my dad wanted right. me to do. I, I was sort of, I, I, I was lost. And, and the one thing I did enjoy doing was volunteering and volunteering at a drug and alcohol treatment center. I volunteered for homeless people down and uh, a buddy of mine was, was uh, getting his license in uh, clinical psychology. He's like, you're really good at helping people. You ever think about doing it full time? It's like, are you nuts? I have a good right. life. I got it all going on. I ended up uh, signing up for uh, the program and, and earning my master's and, and my life changed forever. That is that. Yeah. Let, let's get it. Cause this is, this is, I mean, it's a pretty massive pivot, this first one. I mean, what, you know, again, you talked about helping people. Um, and then, and then you went into, you know, private practice. I mean, and you did it for a, a while and then obviously you started a, you know, .com as well. But, um, you know, tell me about like, what were those five, you know, this kind of first four or five years where again, like, you know, you're a licensed marriage, family and child therapist, um, you know, practicing in psychotherapy and psychoanalysis. So what, what were those five years like? And, you know, what, what, what was the point for you, I guess, where you're like, well, yeah, I'm, I love this, right? Because you, then we'll talk about ther uh, for therapy.com too. You know, what, what, maybe just like we can talk about that, the, the original first few years and then what made you start the website? Cause this is like right at the height, like 1998 for everyone out there, um, you know, of the, the dot com you know, movement, you could call it. So let's talk about those, those first years as a private practice and then the, the dot com and what led you yeah. to, to build that. Yeah, well, in, in California, you don't just get your license once you graduate from school. You actually have to do 3,000 hours of supervised uh, therapy. And so um, while I was wow. in school, that's a I lot. was still 3,000 hours? <laughs> it's a lot, a lot of hours. lot of hours, man. That's like, what, years yeah, yeah, it was a couple. It was basically a couple years, and I was still, uh, I was still working in politics, still working in in real estate. I was going to school. I was working at night at a uh, treatment center for early release prisoners downtown LA. So they had a dual diagnosis. A lot of them were homeless, and uh, yeah, it was a hardcore. It was a hardcore first internship. A lot of the guys I worked with actually died, overdose, committed suicide. So that's some really hardcore patients. And, you know, I was driving, I was driving from Venice to third and Alvarado where, you know, I was going in a, a house that was just a beater and outside there were crack dealers and some of the patients were buying their crack right out there. So 
it was it was an eye-opening experience and I loved it. I thrived. I really enjoyed helping people and I felt that sense of um, just having a who a sense of who I was in the world and wanting to give back and going from this completely secluded Beverly Hills sort of pampered lifestyle to I'm with people who don't have many choices left in life and don't have many options. And if I can be helpful to them, um, it was quite fulfilling. And so I did that, earned my hours, ended up uh, also getting an internship for um, women who were survivors of domestic violence. I met my wife at that internship. She was earning her um, doc or her master's in, in uh, social work and we hit it off. and. And I just felt a better sense of who I was and what I wanted to be. And then I opened up a private practice in Beverly Hills. I, I leased an entire floor of offices because I still had that business piece in right. me. And, um, you know, I was seeing patients. And I remember trying to help some of my tenants that I was subletting out um, fill their practices. So I started a referral service. It was one eight eight four therapy. It was a toll free therapy line to help them build their practices. And and uh, as a kid, I was a programmer. I used to I used to develop in machine language and Pascal and and then Basic. And oh man, you're o that's OG for anybody listening. Oh, Anyone yeah. who says they can, they yep. they can code in Basic, just so you know, that means that you've got real street cred. Well, I, I went beyond that. I was ones and zeros in machine language mm -hmm. and assembly and then, and then punch cards. So I'm really dating myself here. But um, yeah, and the internet was sort of happening. And I remember reading an American Psychological Association study that said two thirds of the American public suffered from a mental disorder in any decade. And, and uh, the majority of them had no idea how to find help. And I was sort of in the business of finding help in my local community yeah. for the therapist. Um, that I that I had in my office space. Why don't I try and go big with this and built out a, a, a first web property was for therapy.com, which was the idea of matching people with the right therapists. And, um, you know, I had no idea how to how to actually build traffic, but I got a list of therapists. We sent beautiful boxes with uh, a mouse pad and a nice letter and we signed up uh, Signed up over a thousand of them, paying a uh, ninety nine dollars a month, and so I had all this great subscription revenue, but I had no clue how to get them clients, and so started imploring them to develop their own content. I was a domainer, so I owned thousands of domains, including depression dot com and eating disorder dot com and all these dot coms, and I basically. Um, would get content from the therapist. I would build out the web properties. I'd put a therapist finder on each site, learned how to SEO, built out a database of all the free resources uh, nationwide. And, and that thing took off to a point where we had close to a million unique visitors on a monthly basis with hundreds of thousands of pages of unique content. And it got to a point I couldn't be a therapist anymore if I really wanted to deliver on yeah. this mission was to help a lot of people find the resources they needed. So that was that, was that transition. Man, that's wild. Yeah, I mean, and you made it, you obviously made it through, right? I mean, you were operating, you got acquired by CRC in 2005, I believe. Uh, yeah. Yep. So, I mean, yeah, you made it from the beginning and through. Did, did you just, did you not take a lot of outside money or, you know, were you able to kind of grow it at your own speed? Yeah, I took a million dollars, which was pretty, a fairly small amount from uh, friends and family and grew it and I was always building a capital efficient business. So it wasn't for me about just yeah. you know, growth at any cost. And uh, we built a great business and, you know, uh, Bain Capital was doing a roll up of the behavioral health care space. And one of our biggest customers was CRC Health, which was the largest drug and alcohol treatment provider yep. in the world. And they basically acquired us at the same time as this uh, treatment facility operator brought me on. I ran sales marketing and I needed a way to earn my my uh, hit my milestones and they had probably 30 different excel spreadsheets and lotus notes and all this stuff and got introduced to salesforce and microsoft and was trying to figure out what crm system i should build to track and measure these hundreds of thousands of web pages and tens of thousands of phone numbers and and outcomes of these therap or these therapists as well as the outcomes of their patients and 
we were the first company to ever put healthcare on uh, on the uh, Salesforce cloud. People thought we were nuts to put HIPAA related data on there, and we went for it, and it was a huge success. and and uh, had a lot of fun. That company grew from, I don't know, 2,000 plus uh, employees to over 6,000. And we were treating, uh, we had 30,000 beds that we needed to fill on a daily basis. And it was awesome. And, you know, the idea of setting something up that's all about helping people find that help that they needed. And we'd set up web properties, people would fill out um, web forms, and then you know, they, they would get called by people that had no idea on how to deal with them. And that was one of my first aha moments was if we had all this data on the prospects that came to the website, we needed to match them with somebody who could actually help them. So setting up call centers by skills base, depending on whatever condition the individual had would deliver a better experience, right? So somebody with a drug and alcohol treatment problem, you don't want to send them a client that's dealing with an right. eating disorder. It's a mismatch. And so using technology to better connect people with the right resource and then some context with that phone call, right? So as we started connecting the telephony to the CRM, and aggregating the marketing data so that we could push that to deliver a better experience. We saw better outcomes. We saw more people admitted to facilities. Um, that was that was an incredible experience for me. And then my grandma was getting really ill at the time, and um, and we had trouble finding assisted living facility for her. And that's sort of how I got into building a second company, all about finding. Uh, seniors the right uh, help for them and, and and that was number two yeah you, and it's what a lot of people just to kind of put this in perspective you know as you're scaling that because you technically i guess what started senior transitions in the mid 2000s um you yeah. know as well too right as yeah. you're still you know technically you're still running you know for therapy independent until you you know you get acquired um the, a question i had is you know it's interesting that your role that you took on as vp of marketing right but as i hear you talk it's like Man, it really sounds more like GM product. <laughs> what was it about marketing again? Like, and you started to scratch some of your own itch uh, itches by you know building out some of the applications and things because you know you've got this technical you know skill set. What was it about, I guess, marketing that I guess yeah. drew you, drew you in? You know, for your kind of first, you probably I can just tell like you've been doing versions. You know, everything you've done has been marketing. You know, up until this point, to you know, and if you kind of boil it down to the essence of marketing. Um, but how did you kind of gravitate to that out of all the you know different options that you could have you know went in house yeah. with? Yeah, interesting because remember healthcare, and this is in the early two thousands. Um, you you didn't want to first of all there wasn't there wasn't sales in healthcare. Nobody was selling healthcare, right? Like the, the only people who were selling healthcare were the pharma reps that were going to doctors, and so. The idea of sales and healthcare didn't exist. It was really how do we market to find patients? And so marketing was pretty much the, the logical choice. I also remember distinctly when, um, when I made it to CRC Health and I met with the leadership there and I told them what I wanted to accomplish, which was ultimately you know, to help them fill their beds, to help them deliver better customer experience to help them deliver better patient outcomes. I sat on the board with folks from large insurance companies. We had a four-star general, Barry McCaffrey, on that board, and they didn't understand the web. The yeah. web was like, you know, no, no clue. And, you know, they thought of marketing as colors and designs and all of that. And I had a real desire, again, sort of fueled by wanting to be understood, wanting to feel important. Um, the idea of evidence-based marketing was this this term I coined because it was all about evidence-based medicine in the early 2000s. And the only way I could get them to understand what I was pitching, which was a lot of expense around uh, a call center, a lot of expense around Salesforce, was to draw the analogy to evidence-based medicine by saying, hey, look, we can do the same thing with evidence in marketing right. as we are doing over here in healthcare. If you allow me to build out the CRM, if you allow me to spend all this market on a per head basis. And um, and so it was sort of marketing, but it was sales, it was technology, it was all of that. And um, 
I had a great CEO that allowed me to build out what I wanted to do. And when I signed the deal to be sold, I told them that I was only going to give them 75% of my time because I had this other idea around assisted living and nursing homes that I wanted to do. And it was, uh, that was sort of how I got the marketing title, yeah, I that's, guess. Yeah. It's, I mean, again, I think it's just such an interesting, you know, skill set mix here of, you know, again, having that technical ability to solve. And I think also start to see where the, where the world was heading again, you know, at this point, like there's no Marketo, there's no, like these tools are like infants at this stage. Right. So this kind of world that we know of, you know, B to B you know, B to B marketing and B to C two is, you know, not that, not that new, um, or not that old. Um, and so then senior transitions. No. So then again, so you, you leave, you eventually leave to do that full time. Uh, what was that like? What was the big reasoning to say, Hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move to this more full time. Yeah. Well, I, well, and I didn't really do it full time. So I, I, I left CRC health, um, started building out senior transitions. It really took off. We became the marketing partner for, I don't know, 4,500 senior living facilities across the country. Again, I had hundreds of domains around senior living, everything from seniorliving.com to Alzheimer's. I had all these amazing domains and built out that. It's, it wasn't that original. I cloned the previous model. Yeah. I built it yeah. out, built out the CRM application, just started the call center started, you know, routing the right traffic to the right people with talking points. We started doing some outbound dialing as well um, because they needed to fill their census. And uh, and then I was hired actually by, uh, at the time, Clarence So, who was CMO of Salesforce, and, and uh, Craig Swensrun, who I think was VP of Marketing, to uh, help Salesforce align some of their inside sales motion with their marketing. I I set up a uh, agency called Demand Results. We did 11 of the first 30 Marketo implementations. And it was this idea of, you know, how do we take this data, this marketing data, and apply a better user or customer experience through the sales process? And, you know, did that for a bunch of great companies, uh, uh, Sharp Solar, and we worked on Workday. We just worked on a bunch of really interesting companies. And then, you know, I, I had done Marketo implementations. I did a few implementations of InsideSales.com. There was no really outbound motion. And then um, in 2011, we, we, we were at a hackathon at Salesforce, and we basically hacked together a, a Twilio API with, uh, with an AdWords API and uh, uh, OS, uh, Apple OS. And, and we won the 2011 Salesforce hackathon by building a... Uh, an inside sales um, contact center on an iPad. And, you know, that year they gave us 20 grand. The next year they gave away a million bucks. So talk about timing. <laughs> but that was, that was the genesis of was Ring DNA. DNA. It was this hybrid contact center on an iPad. How did you, I mean, so just, I mean, kind of following your, your journey here, you know, it, it's, it's kind of interesting just how, you know, life happens and you start to kind of lean toward these other things that, you know, are, are, are very different in terms of, you know, aligning to your, your mission or your values, you know, how, you know, as you kind of start to, you know, in some of these, you're now kind of moving away from, you know, those, the, the things that you talked about earlier around, you know, actually one being a, a you know, practitioner two helping and supporting people. Um, you know, how did you, I guess, like, you know, did you ever think about that, you know, as you were going, you know, starting demand results too? And, um, you know, taking this, you know, you took another, you know, senior transitions through acquisition as well. Like, you know, how did your, I guess, like, maybe your values aren't changing, but definitely your focus is kind of moving toward this more like B2B performance optimization, you know, versus, you know, mm -hmm. working with people every day. Yeah. Well, a couple things. One, no matter what you do, hopefully you're taking your values and, and, and your mission with you. And so whether you're starting a, a big company, a tech firm or anything else, those values come with you. And so I've tried to, no matter who I work with, no matter what sort of companies I'm involved with, bring that. And, and I think I bring as a CEO, I think I bring the the, the, the eyes of, of somebody who wants to be helpful first and, and somebody who wants to help people grow and learn. And, and, and that's just constantly there with me. Um, as I shifted from 
sort of the helping people find senior living and helping people find treatment centers to helping businesses grow. I think what, what always was important for me was that, that journey of someone who needs help, whether you're buying something, whether you're looking for a treatment center, whether you're looking for a pain man, whatever you're looking for, you're a consumer and we're all consumers in many ways. We all buy something and it's confusing and frustrating and, and disappointing in a, uh, in a myriad of ways. And for me, figuring out a way to take all that data, all that information that we have on our customers, our prospect, and deliver a better experience. We were talking about it for 20 years. How do we get rid of these silos? How do we connect with our customers? Well, it's really important. And today, I think we're finally realizing that the customers are the center of everything we do. They're the center of sales. They should be the center of customer support and success. The reason our company is revenue, you want to generate long-term value. You do it by delivering the best customer experience, right? And so if you think of any business as putting the customer in the middle and then building around them, to me, that is where you deliver value. And when I think about the kinds of things we're working on today, which is really about studying how people communicate, right? For us, yes, it's sales, it's support, it's success, but I'm studying language. We're studying how people talk. We're studying how people build rapport and trust. What gets in the way of that? To me, I'm studying all of this stuff that I used to do as a clinician, which is you hypothesize on what makes relationships better or what causes friction, and then you apply an intervention, right? Well, that's what your salespeople are doing. That, that's what your support people are doing. They're connecting with people. They're using language. They're using follow-through. And what we're able to do with this massive data set and these thousands of users is really study what they're doing, apply that knowledge, apply that psychological um, learning, and then test and measure it. So it's really hard as a clinician to test and measure the intervention you make with a right. couple or a kid as to what, whether or that, not that's really working. We can do that today, which is super exciting. What, what, what were the early years like? So, you, so obviously, again, you decide, hey, like, this is going to be a thing. Like, I, th I think there's a thing thing here, right? And what, were, you know, what are some of the things you remember you know, starting in 2013 about you know, the first three, four, five years in you know, building the company? This time you do go and raise you know, money from you know, Goldman, from Kobe's firm, from Palisades, and a few others. Um, you know, what were those first few years like as you're your growing Ring DNA at the time? Yeah, I think like any entrepreneur, you're trying to you're trying to learn fast. You're trying to fail fast. You're trying to uh, hire the best people possible. Um, I think that what was different this time was. It, it was just a bigger mission. I think that the idea of building out something at this scale in an area that I didn't necessarily have a ton of experience. I wasn't a, I wasn't a bag carrying yeah, sales exactly. guy. Right? Yeah, exactly. That wasn't, that wasn't my thing. What I was, I set up inside sales centers and I had sales reps and, but I wasn't, I didn't have the experience that I had in this, in the previous thing. So when we, when we started acquiring customers, I wanted to make sure that the product we built allowed us to fully instrument the journey that sales reps had, to fully understand the type of tools that they needed to improve their performance, while at the same time understanding that the companies that were hiring us really needed to quickly improve the results. But the results were, were really dependent on the reps utilizing the tools and seeing the value. And so you can't just build a, a product to deliver results for yeah. the company. It had to deliver results for the end user. And so we just obsessed on the end user. What would make a day in the life of a sales rep um, better? What would be better for an inbound rep? How could I help a outbound rep perform because tools like inside sales, it was just basically a power dial, oh, yeah. right? And like, okay, great. So I talk to a ton of people. I get hung up on all the time. That experience is horrible, right? So how do we build an experience for a rep where they feel like they can have better conversations? They're more informed. That data that's in our CRM is actually surfaced so that they can have better conversations, more context. Like all of that for me was 
eye-opening, right? So it was like not just marketing and, and, and data for, for the benefit of a return, but it was really a passion to understand what the end user truly needed. And that was the Trojan horse for all of it. It was once we created a tool that added so much value for the rep, then we could study right. everything, right? And and so that's that. Those were the early yeah, years. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. It's interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I definitely see the parallels uh, between the two. And you know, at the end of the day, sales, when done correctly, is really about people helping individuals as well, too, right? Just to achieve, you know, business milestones or goals, depending on what that might be to the the buyer. And so as you're as you're growing and, and scaling, you know, obviously Ring DNA, you know, becomes a, a, a player, a, 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 a big player in this in this space, in this world. Obviously, this is the world that I live in and sales consulting as well, too. So um, what was what tell me a little bit about the, the name change, you know, the move to revenue.io, you know, what was what was that process? You know, what, what did you feel was happening in the business or the, the climate to make that that change? Yeah, so uh, just step back a little bit. When when we started building the initial products, it was really important for me to not just focus on a single product, but to truly try and learn and grow from every part of what we were delivering. And so we listened to our customers. I remember the day it was at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. We had rolled out to a lot of their inside sales team. And one of the things that we had was they, they were comping reps on the amount of time they were talking on the phone. Um, they were comping them on the number of completed phone yep. calls. And, and I remember the moment there was a guy named Bobby, I won't disclose his last name, but we had, we had developed a tool that allowed him to listen in on his reps. And he clicked on the tool and he kept saying, your tool's broken, something's wrong. All I'm hearing is this darn recording. I'm like, what do you mean? And so I literally sat at his desk. He put it on a speakerphone and it was Carnival Cruise Lines IVR. And so we started looking in the data and we saw all of these reps were calling into the same phone number. Well, guess what? Mm, yep. They knew they could complete a call. They knew that they would get their minutes yep. because the IVR never hung up That's on right. them. So you saw all of these things. Guy walked out on the floor. He said, next person who calls the Carnival Cruise Line IVR is fired. That was it. And it was one of those moments. It's like, wow, okay, well, Bobby here can't listen to all his reps. So why don't we start recording these calls so we can review them later? This is like early 2015. And we just started yeah. recording calls all over the place. And I met with a uh, I met with somebody in their API area of their business and he said, you know, we have these great APIs. You can transcribe these phone calls and that would be awesome. So 2015, we started transcribing all the phone calls. Fast forward, we had millions and millions of hours of phone calls. And, uh, and then we started basically running learning models against them to try and understand what, what was an interesting event? What kind yeah. of outcomes? This sort of, sort of therapy cam, came into it. We, we were building cadence and sequencing engines, which were really exciting. We had call tracking. So every phone number had a tracking number with it. Um, we started doing things like building a calendar application. So we had this suite of tools for me. It was, I, I, I love studying, right? Like I, my, my dissertation was, um, on research methodology, how people study data. And I really wanted to study the entire journey that sales reps went through with their customers. And so, you know, flashback two and a half, three years ago, we really had five core products that we would offer across the entire sales process and then study that journey. And so once the vision became, how do we instrument and optimize the entire sales journey well, sales involves marketing, sales involves CS, sales yep. involves support. Um, there was this revenue movement, right? The idea of revenue, there was a uh, analyst at Gartner by the name of Alistair Wolcock, who I was talking to, who was running 
um, he, he was starting to research RevOps and the idea of RevOps. And, and I provided a case study for him on his first RevOps model about two years ago, the difference between empathy and sympathy and why selling with sympathy isn't delivering the experience that's, that, pe that buyers really want. And in order to deliver empathy, you have to ask questions. You have to ask open-ended questions and how can our technology help with that? So we were probably late in terms of branding uh, the rebrand, but it was uh, owned the domain for a while, knew we were going to do it. It's just expensive and scary to rebrand. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, we went for it. Yeah, I love it. We'll, we'll get into that. I've got, I had a, a similar, this is before uh, Ring, Ring uh, DNA's time, but I was a manager at a company. And uh, I got a note from our, they had, they were running some to algorithm to, to flag these types of instances. And, and it was the same thing, two and a half hours of talk time, a hundred dials, but all the reps on my team had to do, right? It wasn't my choice. It was, you know, the boss's boss. And um, I get this thing, like this number has been called 35 times by this rep. I call it fax machine. <laughs> It's like, and I, there was, there was a rep. I caught this kid who literally had a list of numbers to call that he would give to new hires. Like, Craig, what are you doing? But that's it. That just goes back to these perverse incentives that if you're tracking the wrong things, um, it leads to bad behavior. And, and I think we're kind of going through this now. And as we, you know, I want to talk about kind of sales and the future of sales, which obviously I talk a lot about too. Um, you know, you go to like, you know, how we're measuring performance today, right? It, you know, and how, you know, a lot of our clients were moving, trying to move them away from tracking activities as a, as a lead metric um, because of these types of behaviors and just because that we're asking reps to do so many things that aren't like direct call to action based. Whereas before, you know, it was all, every call was the book a meeting, every email was, and, you know, now people got people on LinkedIn and doing all kinds of things. Where, where do you feel the customer experience is going in B2B. So you get a chance to talk to all of these different revenue leaders and executives. And, um, you know, I sh you shared your story about the Carnival Clues. I have this, a similar story about just creating these, continuing to track metrics that we track for a long time. That at, at a certain point of time, it did look very beautiful in this like waterfall, but just is you know, kind of mm -hmm. broken now. What are you excited about as you think about where sales is headed and the customer experience? Yeah, so I think there's a lot of exciting, transformative technologies that we're starting to apply to the sales process to deliver better experiences for our buyers. Um, when I think about where we are today and where we've come from, I think the idea of using technology to augment intelligence of our reps to make them better is really exciting. We've taken all of that data we were talking about, we're extracting that, and we're trying to create those moments that in fact make a difference between a great experience with a rep and a poor experience. And then when you start study enough data, when you study enough examples, you start to realize that there are things that make a difference in your relationships, whether it's your relationship with your wife, your kid, your neighbor, same thing in business, how we communicate with other people, how responsive we are, what we say, what we don't say, our follow through, all of those things impact the relationship. And right now, with buyers essentially having all the control, going out there, doing the research online, looking at G2 Crowd, yeah. looking at all of these review sites, studying the data, finding out from their social networks what they use, why they use it. The buying experience has had to change and it's still behind. Yeah. We're still behind in terms of selling, right? So because of that, how do we optimize? The truth of the matter is that we've been running true AI for a while and there's very few people who actually understand true AI. And what AI is incredibly good at is pattern recognition. It's never going to be, it's never going to replace emotionality. It's never going to replace us as human beings connecting. But what it can do is surface things to make you more human, to make you more connected with other people, to get rid of all the tasks, all the crap that make us 
well, stagnant and not very human. And so using AI to make us more human, to make us meet the moment, to provide us in conversations with those moments, with that, those kind of tips and content and all of that is what I really get excited about. You talked about our two patents earlier. We actually have three now. So our patents are all about helping the seller in the moment provide the best experience that that buyer is looking for. You can only do that with today's technology, and that is really exciting. What, what are what are some of the more tactical, I guess, findings that you you know, obviously, with the ability to analyze so many millions of hours of calls, and again, you know, running true AI against um, you know these data sets. What what are some of the findings that you're seeing um, that are you know, pro nothing's truly universal, but but you're starting to see more and more around top performers. You know, when you think about the people that are doing mm -hmm. well today. Or, you know, are there traits, are there patterns that you've seen in the data um, that, you know, you can, that you can share maybe tactically? Mm -hmm. Well, I'd say I'll use you as an example. So you, I've listened to your podcast for a while. You're an incredible interviewer. You're able to extract value from your guests because you ask very relevant and timely questions. You follow up with great questions. You elicit people's response on an emotional basis. You're a great interviewer. That same, those skills would make for a great sales rep. And I'm sure you were phenomenal at that and teaching people how to do that, asking open-ended questions, listening, mirroring, all of these things. It, Maybe I'm talking too much psychology, but those sort of things are what makes people phenomenal. And so your ability to get a great interview from your guests are some of the same skills that are required for a sales rep to be an exceptional sales rep. And so it really is the art and skill of communicating. And there is a science to it once you start studying it. So how do we apply what you do well to the other 300 interviewers or reps? It's really by studying that and the outcomes, but also understanding that general information or general insights is not very helpful. What I need to do is I need to study what makes you unique so that I can feed you in the moment things that will help you. Every rep, has something that makes them unique. Yeah. They have personality styles, they have temperaments, they have, they have different ways of speaking. So how do we study, yes, on a general sense, the tens of thousands of reps that use our application, but then how do we quickly apply that to this rep talking to this VP of sales at this stage of the sales cycle that will impact the performance of that rep in the moment? That's what we needed. Yeah, well, I appreciate that, thank you. Uh, yes, I was pretty. I was I was pretty decent at sales for a long time. I'm still selling. What am I talking about? You're a CEO. You know how it is. Like we're always selling. Um, but I, yeah, I, I I see that. I, you know, I think maybe you know Howard. I'd love to get your opinion on it. It's it's that's not that different, right? That that's similar to what made someone successful, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago. But what I see is actually almost a, a devolving of how sales, many, many salespeople are being actually trained less, I feel like, around the psychology, right. the, the listening, and like the soft skills. And instead, I see more and more teams that whenever we come in and work with them, it, it's, it's the, the way that they've been trained on, on what that discovery converse, it's like, it's just qualification. It's like, I'm mm -hmm. just going to qualify you. And I, and I feel like it's kind of interesting, as, as to your point, we get more and more data showing these, these traits, and maybe, maybe you don't see it, but I, that's what I've seen. I mean, do you see that in your, in your customers or when you come in sometimes when people are, are not as focused maybe as it feels like maybe even they were, it's like, we just want to get it, see if they're qualified or not, like almost like right out of the gate. Yeah. Well, I think, I think one of the biggest problems, and it's the problem with business today in general, is the idea of scale at any cost, right? With scale at any cost, it means that we're just interested in growth. And so we'll throw more technology, yeah. more people, yeah. more sales, stratify roles, throw more, more, more. The problem is that you hit a point where there's diminishing returns and you're starting to see that with the growth stocks. You're starting to see that with the market in general and the economy. At some point, 
more doesn't work. So you have to get capital efficient. You have to deliver better. You have to improve based on results, right? So that's what I start is what we're starting to see. So if I send you a thousand emails, it's still the same crap emails. If I send you, you know, if I, if all I'm doing is trying to qualify you, do you have this, this, and this, it's not, it, it will get to a point where Yes, every, that's table stakes. Everybody has the basic sales engagement tool that does the exact same thing. Now, how do I improve you as an individual? How do I make sure that in this moment, we know that if you ask a question and you connect with that person based yeah. on the question they just asked, that will improve you. And so I think that there's a lot of time, energy, and money spent on sales training. What people don't do with that training is figure out ways to have continual learning, right. right? Just to have a trainer there once, and hopefully I'm not hurting anybody's business, but just to have the trainer there once to give you that education, to not reinforce yep. that in the moment or not to continue to train is a big miss. And so I see a revenue movement, not as, hey, it's another thing with sales acceleration or sales and not another title, but truly an opportunity to make incremental improvements in everything we do as a business, but that involves a little bit more time, energy spent on actually improving people, not just improving process. Yeah, and, and, you, yeah, and again, you talk about this, this idea of, again, like caring about the people and, and helping them to develop skills. And, and I think that, again, what I, I just, I really feel like in sales, we're, we're, we're starting, we're, like you said, it's the pressure. I agree 100%, right? It's as you bring more people in, it feels like it's a shortcut, but the reality is you're just, you're, you're cutting yourself short by, by teaching people like those techniques. And I, and obviously I agree hundred percent on the training front. You know, we, we, we almost, uh, outside of current customers, we, we stopped doing trainings and workshops because, uh, in 2017, it made a concerted effort of like, without the reinforcement, who cares? People, yeah, sure. Maybe a few people, you know, 10% of the people will get something out of it, but that's 90% of people that'll go back and continue to do the same things that they did, you know, the day before you showed up. And, and I do feel like, yeah, we have to take uh, that, that idea, like take that quality versus the more button. And that, and that's the unfortunate part about what happened. Again, you talked about, you know, um, you know, revenue.io trying to make this, you know, the sales rep have better human interactions. And I feel like, you know, really what we've done is almost, again, went the opposite way. We've said, more interactions is better than higher quality interactions. And we're still using a lot of those same metrics. I'm sure you see it with your clients, right? Of, you know, calls and th that story that you, that you just told about, you know, HP is, is, a, is a perfect example. And that's still how people are leading teams today many, many times. And, and what, are, what are the most forward, as we kind of start to wrap up here, I want to kind of talk about like the future. What are some of the more forward organizations? How are they using your platform to be more thoughtful, to focus on the human activities and empowering their people? Like what are like, are, are there companies that you feel are doing a really good job of this and, and what are they doing? Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of companies and leaders out there trying to do their best and improve and, and they're definitely they're definitely getting more and more of the focus of the board, of the CEO, because they're able to deliver those long-term predictable results, right? And that's what, it, what it's about, whether you're ramping your reps faster or you're able to improve the customer experience, thereby uh, decreasing your sales cycle, they're studying and taking care of their people, right? Which means they're, providing technology, not just to make them go faster, but they're providing technology and learning and training and growth. They're actually hiring coaches. Um, they're, they're investing in revenue.io, not to pitch my own stuff, but things <laughs> well, that will actually me measure your conversations in the moment, provide that value, tell your rep he's not asking enough questions because it's listening, whether you're on Zoom or in a phone call, it's like having that guide there, that sage, that coach all the time. We all need coaching. We all need training. We all need education. You look at the best athletes in the world, they're constantly working. The best salespeople, the best business people, they're always trying to grow personally and professionally. So where do we look? Where do we start? Well, you build systems that will look at them 
and give them those hints, those areas where if they just make this little tweak, they'll improve. Their skills will improve. That, that's the kind of thing that people are investing in. And those companies aren't going to be the ones that are here today, growth at all costs, and then gone tomorrow. Those will be the ones that will create unique user experiences that are incredibly valuable, that will continue to deliver that value, that will outperform their peers and be here for the long run. I love that. Yeah. And I think that that's so true, right? It's, it's we have these tools to not have to make some of the, you know, I asked you about general, like, hey, what are you seeing? But, but the reality is you know, kind of where you took it, which is it's about the individual, right? And that now that we have tools that can help manage to the individual more effectively, I think we has, as leaders have to make sure that, that we're really implementing that all the way down versus really treating like we have for a long time, everyone with the same metrics and the same, the same KPIs and everyone's supposed to just play to the middle as opposed to now with tools you know, like revenue.io, you can, you can manage and lead to the individual. Um, and that's really what this is all about, what it should be all about on the front lines um, and all the way up. And so as, as we wrap up here, my, my final question I ask everyone is, you know, what's, what's next for you? What's, what's like the latest and greatest? Obviously, continue to, to crank at revenue.io. Anything personally or with the business that you're super excited about for this year or next? Yeah, I'm really interested in continuing this 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 pattern of discovery and and seeking knowledge that not just helps businesses today, but taking all this incredible data about relationships. And yes, many of them are in the context of sales and support, but applying that to communication in general. How do we as a society learn to better communicate? better listen, better connect with other people. And we're building that data set through sales, through marketing, through revenue.io that can be applied to dating, yeah. family relationships. My kids talk to me with their phones in front of their face. We need to move back to finding ways to better communicate and better connect with people. And we can do it. I love that. I love that. And I really feel like in today's day and age, it, the, the ability to stand out is actually pretty high. If you, if, you, if you can listen, if you can be engaged, um, just show a little bit of interest, a recap for God's sake, you know, like there's just so, there's so many opportunities I think for people listening and, and I really appreciate it. I think the story, Howard, just like, you know, your different journeys and, and how you're, you know, how you've aligned now to where, you know, again, it kind of, I, I see the, the through line now, right, of, of again, now, now you've got this other massive data set that you can use to help and improve the lives of people and millions of sellers as well too, which is, which is really cool, man. So obviously as someone who's very focused on helping to create a, a new future for sales as well, or an evolved future, I can definitely get behind it. So really big. Thank you. I'm sure my listeners got a ton out of this as well too, and things that they can go and understanding the different paths that you meander down and learning coding to again, going and quitting a very lucrative, you know, real estate career to, you know, the therapy and now to what you're doing now is, is really an awesome story, man. So thank you so much for sharing. Uh, Jake, thank you so much for being you and sharing people's amazing story and, and for adding value because you do it every day. And I appreciate oh, thank it. you, man. I appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you listening and we will see you next week on the Jake Dunlap show. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for tuning in to another extremely fun and interesting episode. I thought it was fun and interesting, so I hope you did too, of the Jake Dunlap Show. Uh, really great just breaking down everything that makes people who they are, the success, the trials and errors. And I hope that you enjoyed it as much as I did. Make sure to subscribe on your favorite platform and make sure more than anything to go over to jakedunlap.com. That's where you're going to stay up to date on all the latest guests, additional details, prep notes. We're going to be sharing everything on jakedunlap.com. So go ahead, go over there. You can subscribe there as well too. And we will see you next week on the Jake Dunlap Show.